Hello and welcome to New Humanum. We're working in Westminster today on the fringes of a large political conference, NatCon 23. It stands for National Conservatism. It's the first of its type ever held in the UK. There are all sorts of people at it, some of them religiously inclined, some of them not. Among their number was the Reverend Daniel French. Father French is a vicar who practices on the south coast of England. He's also one of the co-hosts of a well-liked and well-followed uh, podcast called Irreverend, which concentrates on Anglican matters. So when I sat down with Father French, I asked him first of all, why did he involve himself in that particular outlet? So Daniel French, thank you very much for uh, coming on New, New Humanum. Um, so tell me about the podcast. It's quite an unusual thing for a vicar to do. Why did you get involved in that? Now I could say because we like the sound of our own voices, you know, and, and it's just another pulpit. But um, it, it came out of a series of um, friendly chats with new friends that I'd, I'd made. Um, connected to various people like Dr. James Orr uh, and um, Jamie and Tom and I were having conversations in the uh, on Zoom as it was. We'd never, I'd never met them. They, they knew each other uh, and I think we were a consolation to each other. We talked about what was happening in terms of uh, our anxieties about the, uh, the, the lockdowns uh, and how we felt that was massively overplayed, how that was affecting the church, how that was kind of, you know, touching us uh, uh, to, the, to the, cutting us to the heart. Uh, and um, Tom and Jamie started the podcast uh, and then invited me on a few months later. Uh, and so we decided, you know, let's have this extended conversation once a week. It's not massively onerous. Uh, and um, include some prayer and Bible study. It's uh, you know it's less shouty as a medium than a, than a lot of social media. So you know it it, it seemed a natural place for us to do a more humane space. Uh, and um, to, to begin with, we had just a few hundred, and then I, I think something round about sort of Easter time uh, clearly happened in terms of ratings or viewings. Uh, and the downloads uh, went up and um, we got up into the charts, so to speak. And, uh, you know, we, we seem to be touching a nerve. Uh, uh, concerned vicars, you know, f yes, fired up for the fired up for the gospel, wanting, I think, to uh, promote you know, a, uh, an authentic supernatural uh, vision of Christianity. Uh, and um, that seemed to touch upon people, you know, so that there, there it is. Described like that, it seems the most natural thing in the world to do. And it's obviously a way, isn't it, of, of using a new kind of medium uh, to reach people who are out there wanting to be reached. Mm. And, and actually have, uh, uh, have time with, you know, AirPods, EarPods, they're in the gym, they're in the car, they're um, going out for their jog, they're in the kitchen, uh, and this is, uh, like with audio books, this is a way to listen to uh, an extended, deeper conversation mm -hmm. uh, where people are digging deep and responding to questions and, uh, and what have you. Uh, so it's a more kind of considered format, uh, and I think that, that clearly appeals. And we found that in the lockdown period, what was extraordinary was that there seemed to be a sort of a phenomenon. In fact, I think it kind of was beginning in the middle of the last decade where there was a migration back to Christianity, particularly in the sort of you know, uh, under 40s uh, generation, the millennials, uh, the sort of post Jordan Peterson people were going, uh, I think, find it, finding that a lot of the people that we're talking to have found it that, that the sort of new atheism narrative uh, it is now depleted uh, and doesn't seem to be the firewall 
in terms of uh, the, the sort of craziness of the world mm. and that actually that Christianity with the greatest story ever told actually it's looking more and more plausible uh, and um, and if it's a little bit weird well so what you know uh, and here were three vicars willing to kind of talk into that so we get uh, quite an extraordinary I think people will be quite surprised at the amount of I mean, my wife calls it fan mail you know another fan mail dear it either uh, handwritten letters, emails, telegram, it, um, Twitter, comments from folks. I mean, I think, I, I would say in the last two years, I probably heard several thousand conversion stories, uh, uh, several different versions, several thousand different versions of this migration back to Christianity in the UK. And I've heard some today at the conference that you and I uh, have been to, um, where people have said, you know, Something kind of disturbed me about what happened back in 2020 uh, and I, I've reached out back to the, the faith that, that I either discarded or, mm. or thought was childish or irrelevant and actually found some meat there. Help me take that forward. You know, so that's where we're at. And we'll, we'll have something like uh, on our Telegram group we could have weekly 60 questions, sort of, you know, agony aunt type things to um, the deep theological... Um, it's a rip-roaring success, isn't yeah, it, actually? And, and, you know, at a <laughs> moment where we're in the top 10, we're bouncing around the top 10, and the other competitors are all Americans. Amazing. So, you know... Now, you touched on something there, because you said, you know, how you started in 2020, and how, how difficult and hurtful you found that time when all the churches, of course, were yeah. closed. A lot of us felt um, that the way that the, the hierarchy, both in the Church of England and in the Catholic Church and other congregations, you know, they just acceded to the government request to close churches. I felt it was wrong, wasn't it? Robin, how long have we got? <laughs> uh, I, I actually get quite cut up about this. So, um, a couple of days after that, the, the Church of England, after Boris's announcement, the Church of England made an official announcement uh, that we were to immediately vacate our church buildings because this was uh, a, da you know, a, a danger uh, and we were to do all our ministries essentially from home. Uh, I sat outside when the verger told me this, he said, have you seen this? I sat and wept at the steps of my church in Salcombe and thought, how can I be a company man anymore? What on earth have we done? You know, we proclaim uh, a supernatural religion. Uh, these buildings in my own small c Catholic spirituality are more than just stone you know, they they are uh, they're sacred spaces uh, and we are you know ambassadors to mm. to to that to those places as, as clergy uh, and to say that it was okay to go to the supermarket but not to the church I mean, for goodness sake, we've been practicing social distance in the Church of England for the last, you know, 500 years. Everybody sits at the back. Uh, everybody sits trying to get people to, to even do the sign of yeah. peace. Yeah. It's a task in itself. It we're, goes against the English grain, doesn't very it? very rehearsed <laughs> at, at actually all of this. Why did we have to do this? And uh, the weeks that followed over and over again, you know, I, I saw it. Um, in, from, I heard it from people, I saw it online, uh, and that this was a massive miscalculation. Yes. Uh, you know, how could we then face uh, our greatest critics who could say, well, the emperor has no clothes. Did you? When, when the pandemic came, uh, you retreated. Uh, it was shameful. It was shameful. Do you know, I'll, I'll give you, a, I'll give you an, an instance, uh, and perhaps I'm putting myself into trouble here, but, you know, 
I'm going to write. I'm writing a book on introducing Christianity, which I, I'm going to preface this little story. One of our parishioners uh, at the time, a, a 16-year-old convert to Christianity, uh, who wants now to um, go through the discernment process to ordination, came to my door in week three and said, I cannot bear another day without Holy Communion. And what I thought was, where is everybody else? Mm. Mm. Do you know? Yeah. Where, where, where is everybody? Mm. Why is it that this uh, new Christian, a child, is here at my door wanting the sacrament? You know, I'm mindful of the words of Christ in John 6. You know, unless you eat my flesh and drink your blood, you can have no life in me. So this is not a, you know, this for, 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 for where I'm coming from, uh, this is uh, not, the, the Eucharist, Holy Communion, it, it is not some sort of optional extra. Um, it's the heart of the matter. It's the heart of the matter. And to hear that, and I thought, you've got it, you've understood it. Yeah. You're prepared to break the law and to get the fine. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, so, uh, well, what we did next, well... <laughs> <laughs> you gave him communion. You gave him communion. Yeah. I, I felt duty-bound, and I felt duty-bound where, you know, we were, where people rang up and said, you know, my husband's dying, can you come give the last rites? Now, as far as I understood from the legislation, what was I supposed to do that, from an iPad? <laughs> You know, well, and, I, and I, I went into some of those situations, and there's the community nurse, you know, with an apron on, uh, and, I thought, well, and I'm having to say, you're not going to tell anybody, are you? Because I, I can't be bothered with all the fuss and hoo ha. But uh, you know, this, this dear soul here needs viaticum. Good for uh, you, I would say. Um, so let me take you back into your own personal story. So. You're a vicar now, clearly, and, and in midlife. Um, so how did that start? Were you always, did you come from a religious background? Were you, were you, uh, were you churched as a, as a young man? W what's the story? Uh, y yes, yes and no. Um, I was adopted by my um, paternal grandparents for various reasons, uh, who um, lived uh, between Brussels and, and then the edge of Dartmoor <laughs> near Plymouth. Uh, and they returned to faith when I was in my teens, uh, which was an interesting thing, actually, you know, because I'm surprised in many ways that I decided to go with it because they made me dress up in Sunday yeah. best to go to this. And uh, that was the only thing that I really balked at. Uh, and uh, the parish priest, who was a sort of Gandalf type figure, and realised, he said, actually, if you become an altar server, you can wear a robe, and maybe, maybe um, we can get your folks to uh, dispense with the, the tie and shirt, you know. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I was hooked, and um, he became a lifelong friend. I named my son after him, uh, and was able to do his funeral a few years back. To, um, to a great privilege and honour to be able to do to do so, and. and I hope his, some of his wisdom rubbed off, rubbed off on me. Um, uh, interestingly enough, he, he was a, a diocesan exorcist, uh, as well as a trained psychologist, um, a man who'd come to, to ministry to the cloth late, uh, having been a, a city, worked in the city, you know, in the sort of bowler hat days. So um, had this immense gravitas uh, and I just sort of lapped it up, to be honest. Uh, and in my 20s, uh, went in, after a brief excursion into computer science, went off into ministry uh, and um, uh, married, then went to um, my wife's um, homeland up in Aberdeen uh, and then felt the call to come back to Devon, you know, and uh, uh, have... Um, now I find myself 25 years later having been ordained, wondering where the time's gone. But, you know, I, it's the best job in the world. Um, and uh, every day is different. And I think people would be amazed at the balmy stuff that comes our way. Um, and it, I, I, could, 
I could fill a book with anecdotes. Well, you are doing by yeah. the sound of it. But uh, the um, and has has faith for you since you since that you were that young man who became entranced by the idea of it, and then went into ministry. Has faith always been a certainty for you? Has the has it always been a foundation never cracked? You've never had doubts. I think I tried to be an atheist for a day, but I wasn't very good at it. Um, but uh, uh, and that was after you know a very sort of brutal event in a in a neighbouring parish, um, which was I, I was struggling to process. I, I would say. Faith has been a relationship, uh, and rather than a, a series of logical propositions, and you grow into relationships when they're hopefully they're good and you know healthy, and, and you mature into that. So, uh, uh, you know, I'm amazed at the man of Nazareth's patience with me, <laughs> with me, and his good humour that that, that um, uh, at 54. Uh, this this uh, this priest seems to still be of some value, <laughs> and he, he seems to take uh, great patience with um, some of my eccentricities in it and um, uh, zealousness for for the kingdom of God. Um, so it, it it's been more it's been more that way than um, I, I've not seen it as a series of certainties, but. A, a friendship that's grown that's I don't know do you know I think I think I must be one of these very what's the word right brain left brain doesn't it where you're you're yes. more fired I always get it muddled up yeah, myself. But, yeah likewise I think that's what left brain people do <laughs> we're not very good at lasering in on the facts of it um again and having grown up for a period on the edge of the moors uh and the sea and the the, the natural environment, which which I think brings you to a certain attentiveness to things, uh, I'm I'm more predisposed to the artistic, um, and I I think that imaginative side finds faith a lot easier. Uh, you know, we we sort of enter into the story more. Um, uh, I, th I think we're, as Ian McGilchrist has sort of pointed out, we're a very overly rationalistic culture, uh, uh, and even more so in the sort of digital age. You know, so um, my, my my temperament and my sense of things and the the sense of the presence of God uh, being everywhere is, um, in fact, at times I I say. Can I say this? I won't say this. It sounds almost. I'll say it off camera. But you know, God's a nuisance at times. Because I think, can you give me a break, the, <laughs> Lord? You know, the hound of heaven. Yeah, the hound of heaven. Exactly. The hound. Yes. Can you give me a break, Lord? You know. Um, <laughs> so, um, I mean, you've lived now. So you've been in ministry what for twenty five years? Twenty five years. It's not been an easy couple of decades for the church, has it? No. And uh, what is your, what is your, how would you sum up where the, the, the Church of England is right now? I mean, to an outsider, which I am, um, the, it seems that there is deep unease within, within, within the church and, and, and some quite serious divisions on matters, for instance, like the blessing of same-sex mm. marriages and all that. Um, same-sex couples. I mean, how, what does it look like from the inside to you? It's tragic, isn't it? Uh, because we want our energies truly to be in reaching out to people, to in evangelization, and yet there is this, you know, great schism that is in the culture, and it cuts right through the heart of, I think, nearly every denomination. Uh, and it, just as it cuts through, you know, family homes, uh, and um, uh, again, it's a sort of, sort of digitalization, isn't it? Uh, everything is cut into binaries: them and us, and likewise in this, t in this too. And um, 
I, I wonder if this is not a dissimilar time for the Church of England to, uh, now was it in the 18th century, Samuel, I always get his name wrong, Pete. Yeah, Peeps. Peeps, isn't it? I want to say Peppers, but Peeps, who um, I think attended St Paul's Cathedral and there were like 17 people there, yeah. you know, an empty shell of a building. Is that what we're heading for when deism was the, the kind of predominant yes. fashionable religion because uh, uh, as a sort of form of, you know, it has elements of Gnosticism or semi-Arianism, sorry, sorry that, that, that make a, a safe but bourgeois belief system that mm. makes few demands on you. Uh, and you can imagine how that is uh, appetizing to the establishment of the time then, and this seems like a repeat of it. Um, so you know that the tide comes in and out, uh, and I th I think we're we're heading to a period of exile. I mean, I find that personally quite. Painful to think that, um, to use another analogy, one from the Bible, you know, we may have 60, 70 years of, uh, of exile as, uh, as a faith within this country it, it, across the denominations, you know, that, that um, the, the Christian church may have to have its Good Friday in the middle of the 21st century where systemically um, organising an organised Christian religion uh, is uh, a fraction of what it is of what, of what it is now, uh, and maybe we need that. Maybe that it maybe that is the uh, uh, in the good sense of the word that the wrath of God. Mm -hmm. um, yes, a comfortable church is a comfortable and church could be a very complacent church, of course. So, so these things are um, they're double edged. Um, but you mentioned to me earlier, we were talking, and you were saying how the hierarchy has moved um, on many of these issues quite a long way away from where the ordinary congregation is. I mean, is that, is that how you see it? No. Uh, Why is that? I mean, so, so the question that begs, of course, is, okay, why is the hierarchy in some way so uh, detached from the concerns and anxieties and beliefs of the people that they serve? Why is that? Well, um, like the Holy Trinity, that um, the hierarchy is a mystery <laughs> in itself. Uh, It clearly has happened in nearly every institution, hasn't it, Robin? It has. Uh, so why shouldn't it happen in the Church of England? Uh, I think if we were, say, positioned as an Anglican province in the middle of Africa, uh, there would be a different situation because the, the Church there actually, ironically, experiences more of its um, universality, it's, it's global Catholic presence and you can't just go off and do your own thing as, uh, as a church, uh, even if that's what the, uh, the country would like you to do, because the others will hold you to account. Yeah, and, and if you speak to a lot of um, uh, Anglicans that are in favour of some of the sort of pro progressivist agendas, they'll say, oh, well, we should just jettison that anyway. Who cares what the rest of the world thinks? Um, which is a, a deeply troubling thought, you know, that we become just a sort of parochial organisation, mm. having been the mother church to the, the third largest Christian denomination on the planet, you know. Uh, Do you think that, that, that actually the Anglican Communion is fracturing, I mean, it has fractured already. I mean, where are we in that process, do you think? Well, uh, it's a very British thing, isn't it? Anglicanism's sort of very polite in its schisms. Um, 
uh, we're, we're in the sort of not talking phase really of the marriage, uh, sadly. Yeah. How that is repaired, I, I do not know. I, I, I don't think it bodes well. Mm. Um, I mean, the, I can't remember who it was who quipped um, about the, uh, uh, the Tory party being the, um, no, the, the Anglican Church being the Tory party at prayer. Is that, I mean, is it, is it your experience as, as a frontline vicar, as it were, that the laity tend to be socially conservative? I mean, is that generally the pattern? Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I, I listened to one prelate snarl about the Daily Mail in front of a whole load of people, and I watched the reaction. Which was? A deep taking in of breath. A polite deep taking in a breath, yes. and I thought you've judged this wrong. Yes. You, you've pitched this um, from within a bubble, and not realised actually your constituency are, are on the whole small C conservative people, as as I think you know most Brits are. I agree. But by temperament, mm. uh, uh, they are not by nature attracted to a sort of you know social activist um, view of the world uh, uh, and um, th this is the tragedy really that <sighs> how, how could I put this well when I, I when I've watched for instance Dr. Peterson deliver his Bible series and you look in these auditoriums and here is a man who is not a theologian who seems to be making it up as he's going along and everyone's leaning forward in the auditorium, and it's full of young people, young, uh, enthusiastic adults who seek to repair their lives. Uh, and Peterson doesn't claim to be a Christian as far as I know, but he's sort of on a journey, you know, and, and, and sharing that journey, and he's filling stadiums, auditoriums, and what have you, sell out. Uh, why is the hierarchy not doing that? Mm -hmm. Why are they dismissing him as a deplorable? Mm -hmm. uh, why at this conference uh, are there no bishops here? Uh, uh, the, the speech that Miriam Coates gave in the, in the talk about the great crisis of population, which underlies a spiritual uh, anxiety and schism in, in our country, you know, we don't want to have children because we don't know why we should, you know, and what's, we don't feel that there's a hope for things, if that's the underlying message. I think the church is quite, you know, can park its tanks here very successfully. Yeah. Uh, and likewise, you know, we have a, uh, a clear mental health crisis uh, which borders on the spiritual lands very, very, very easily. Uh, you do not have to use, you know, to use the tank analogy. You don't have to move your tanks far to actually be having spiritual conversations on the back of this. Because, again, as we've heard in the talks that you and I have been to, it comes down to what does it mean to be a human? What does it mean to be made in the image and glory of God? You know, uh, is that something we can take forward, or is it something that we should trash and adapt? Uh, and um, I find, you know, I, I find the conversations with um, with ordinary people on the street. You start talking about this, and people are leaning in mm. and thinking, "Why isn't everybody else doing this?" Yeah, I'll give you an instance. Uh, are talking to a young couple bringing their children for um, baptism. So I go, I go, you go and see the parents, you talk about what the christening service involves, uh, what the symbolism is of it. And I generally try to have a bit of a pit and patter about parenting. Uh, and it's a, it's a difficult one, the, these conversations, because parents are often anxious that you're going to give them a grilling. And you're anxious that they're that, they're anxious, you know, and we're, we're all trying to be terribly polite and Anglican and not say, well, 
I, I don't want to sort of put the lights on you and say, why are you here? Are you going to be turning up every Sunday from henceforth? Because you know that it's, that's quite a, a big leap for them yeah. to do. You know, so uh, the, the new kind of conversation I, I've tried to have is along the lines of, what are you going to say when baby Fred is 12 years old in 2035, let's say, and says, come on, Dad, why can't I have the digital implant? Everybody else has it. What are you going to say? And they, you, know, you can see an instantly that, well, yeah, that has been worrying about us where this, all this tech stuff's going. Uh, and I was saying this to parents a couple of days ago, and the baby was, had got Dad's phone and was licking it. You know? And I said, you know, if I give one bit of advice as a parent is give in to that at the very last moment. Uh, try and give them a childhood that it is as rich and as diverse and as screen free as possible and you'll be doing a very Christian thing you'll be making your home into a domestic church and if your home's going to become the domestic church the, your little Noah's Ark against this stuff and you're going to get a heck of a lot of backlash from this you're going to get uh, their anger because they're going to be bullied by this at school uh, you're going to get sneering from other parents. Uh, how are you going to support each other in that? And how can we as a church help you be the domestic church that you need to be in your home? Uh, and I think from that comes the log logical progression that, well, you actually need to be part of us for us to help you be you know, have that little safe flotilla <laughs> in the di digital deluge because this is a deeply anti-Christian thing that is coming at us fast and furious. And, and, I, and I, I think we can be up front as Christians and say, you know, it's the kingdom of God or it's the machine. Or what did Mary Harrington call it? Cyborg theocracy. Yes. Everybody has a theology. Yes. Uh, you know, so, so uh, the, this is, I think, where the battle lines are, and I, I, find, I think this is easy pickings. It, you know, so, um, but, but we seem to, you know, have um, a, a, policy, a policy apparatchiks in, in the church, and not far from here in Church House, whose vision is that we need to reach out to the tiny minority of social activists who might just come to church, who they might just convince that church is not, that even though church is, you know, a toxic, heteronormative, patriarchal uh, institution that, that should never be forgiven, they might just come because the vicar has a good sermon on this Sunday. Yeah, right. I yeah, just... right. They're not going to come. They're never going to come. Yeah. And I think that grief within the hierarchy has yet to be met. They are not going to come. Bishops, they're not coming. If you're watching, they're not coming. They're never coming. Uh, but there are thousands of others who are, who are oven ready to come. Isn't the truth of this thing? You mentioned Jordan Peterson. And of course, he, is, he has um, connected with thousands, hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of young people around the world. And isn't the, isn't the truth of that, doesn't that demonstrate the fact that, that the eternal quest of mankind since, since known history has been a search for meaning? And that search for meaning can be answered by faith and by few other things, I think. Yeah, uh, and, uh, and that betrays a lack of confidence in the churches when we're apologising for this. Yes. Uh, you know, I'm told at the conference that, that, that there is a, um, a speaker who has said, let's put down the God, you know, let, let's tone down the God stuff. Yes. Now, I think it's a miscalculation. Actually, that the that you know you don't have to go all hammer and tongs at, at this, 
but actually that the the spiritual, the transcendent, uh, you know, the great truths of Christianity, uh, and we have a lot of Jewish people here today as well, uh, speak into this conversation. You know, upstream from the culture war is a spiritual war, uh, and let's have confidence in that uh, and speak into that. I, I, I think people are more up for that conversation now than ever before. And it's a great miscalculation to, let's say, oh, let's not do God. When you, but, so you're part of the church. You presumably can talk to bishops. You, you have an entree to the hierarchy. What do they say when you have these conversations? Or do you have these conversations? Will, will yeah, they? There, there are some who have had the conversation with, with me and, um, uh, I think off the record there are uh, there are lots of positive sounds from some either saying those I've talked to and befriended on this uh, I suspect there is there's a fear of cancel culture there there's a feeling of being ill-equipped I think to go out you know that that if you're if you're the member of the hierarchy who's going to stick your neck out, who's going to be behind you, uh, if you've got an a, a apparatus around you that isn't necessarily sympathetic, that could be a problem. Mm. Um, yeah, so I think there's, per, there's, there's, there's issues of personal confidence and that, and um, I can see why. You know, uh, and there, there are others who just, you know, are just not interested and, you know, they think that we've got to essentially talk up, say, save the planet rather than save souls, you know, and we've got to kind of look at the, the um, affirming the great progressivist issues to, um, in a sense, remarket ourselves. Well, uh, good luck with that. But I think those who, who do um, uh, see it more in the way that you and I would, um, are just nervous about putting their toe in the, in the waters. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, the, the last high-profile high um, intervention by a bishop happened just a few days ago, didn't it, when um, uh, Archbishop Welby um, uh, spoke out against the, um, the immigration bill. And um, when I hear that kind of thing, I think, well, that is such an easy free hit for him and he knows that uh, that'll find favor with a large part of the media the BBC and so on will relay those kind of messages without any hesitation at all because it's very much in line with what they think and so the Archbishop has aligned himself with a progressive agenda which is almost like you know about borders free countries an impractical a totally impractical and very unpopular idea actually in the country. So why do that? Why curry favour with um, progressives when there's a constituency out there which is just yearning for some leadership on an issue like this, a different kind of and leadership? And would, you know, die on the hill Yes. for a voice that did. Indeed. Within, I mean, seriously seriously could have massive political influence mm. yeah um, at, and if looked at you know t take a an issue that gets barely any voice um, which is that of, that of abortion uh, and a few weeks ago we had the uh, anniversary of that the awful anniversary of that act, um, uh, which was noted by a, a number of people uh, organising in the in the pro life groups and what have you, uh, and again there was a, there was a, uh, a deafening silence. That of course is a very unfashionable cause. Very. The the least fashionable. The course. least fashionable oh, cause. I would say. You know so. Why not align yourself with a series of least fashionable causes? I mean, today the Daily Telegraph has come out with this 
poll about one in ten t teenagers are considering changing their gender. I mean, I I can't even get my head round the well, implications yeah. of that. And there was a subsequent story you may have seen where uh, you know supposedly sympathetic left-wing parents when this happened to their child are horrified and remain in a state of um, eggshells depression it's almost as if the you know that the numinous of darkness was hanging over this family uh, n and um, uh, Where are the voices, official voices from the C of E to say, this ain't right. This, 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 this unnerves us um, that one in ten teenagers should so dislike the gender that they're in. And I suspect the majority of that is going to be female transitioning to male. Uh, what does that say about womanhood, femininity? power, aspiration. What does that say about our sense of who we are as human beings in relation to each other? What does that say about motherhood? You know, um, this, it's th th these, are, these are, you know, and you don't this have to go a... nuts, uh, I think, to actually, you know, I, I'm not talking about a, a, a an all out a, attack uh, on this but just a considered reply a, a, you know, a, 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 for the church to say look we, we need to sit down and actually think about this theologically Where, why are we at this position what is this telling about rather than just say oh well you know we, we have to accept that gender is now a fluid thing that it's a concept and uh, you know I, I, I'll, give you, I'll give you a story. <laughs> we've, got, we, we've got back. We, yeah. we got, we've got by a couple of millennia without thinking that, without actually, thinking, and yeah. seeing you quite well. Uh, you? I, um, I was at a theological lecture a few years ago where uh, this was being described by a speaker who was um, brought in to come and explain all the flags, uh, the the you know the. the that the dozens of orientations and genders and what have you, uh, so that we could understand just the semantics of this. And one of the um, listeners, a young theology student, put his hand up and said, I wonder what Thomas Aquinas has to say about this uh, idea that we as human beings are essentially uh, you know, souls trapped in a body. Is that his, his sense of how the human person works? And the speaker said, Thomas who? <laughs> Do you know Thomas who? <laughs> Thomas who? You know, uh, and, and that was the question that we needed to answer, is how have we over the centuries come to this point where suddenly, where we're questioning the very metaphysic of our humanity. Well, you see, he's not a guardian com columnist, is he, Aquinas? He missed a trick there. Tell me this, though, um, Daniel. That, um, so there have been quite a lot of priests in the C of E who've, who've left the church and migrated elsewhere. So I'm thinking that, um, for instance, Gavin Ashenden, someone I, I know that you know of, I don't know if you know him personally, but. Does it wound you to see um, priests like that deserting the CV because of these issues, or do you sympathise with their position? The, the irony for me is that in the last two years, um, I've become <laughs> spiritually more Anglican. <laughs> And, and yet feel less part of the apparatus. You know, I've come to uh, rediscover, for instance, the 1662, not as a chore that I had to do once a week to placate a few, but as a, a, 
uh, as <laughs> a program of renewal, uh, a text that demands something of me. Uh, you know, for I have followed the desires and devices too much of my own heart to mm. quote the opening. This is the article. The article yeah, yes. that I wrote in the Spectator. Uh, you know, that, so so what I'm saying on the back of that is that I do, I, I, I sympathise with people, you know, who want to find the, the denomination that suits their need, but I do think we have incredible treasures, uh, and we should be careful about abandoning them. And to be honest, actually, in a generation's time. If the progressivist agenda is low birth rate, small, you know, and um, a kind of Malthusianism that infects theology, well, they're not going to be here anyway. So, what we're going to have empty churches, you know, um, it, uh, we'll just be able to walk into Westminster Abbey there and say, well, there's no one left to operate it because they've, you know, it's just become a shell operation. So you know, this is a temporary thing, I think. And the, you know, there is a, a, a an irony here, isn't there? Because you, um, through the medium of this podcast, have suddenly discovered, or I sense from what you say, this must be a very joyful thing, to um, be a priest and to be besieged, as it were, by by demands and inquiries yeah. from people who who are uh, seeking, they're, they're on the search, and you are there, you know, providing the answers. It must be a very fulfilling thing. It's lovely in terms of, I suppose in my head, I had thought in my teens, I knew that there was going to be decline. I trained along people who thought that, you know, we could, turn it around, that there was some magic formula, some piece of marketing that we weren't doing, uh, some rejigging of the management of the church, uh, changing the, uh, you know, the frontline staff, and it would all whoosh happen. I knew from the onset, this isn't going to be the story. This is going to be difficult. I hadn't imagined that at this time in my life, that though there is this decline, there is also this undercurrent coming up. And I'm not saying it's massive, but it's joyous to see, and it's heartening. And, you know, in a way I couldn't care that it's come to me or to anybody else, but the fact that it has come, and, it, and you can see it, and it's on, it's on my own personal radar, is lovely because that gives that gives hope and I think I'm not going to see the promised land um, but maybe the priests to come uh, or their their successors their kind of spiritual grandchildren <laughs> will 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 see it you know and that we won't weep by the rivers of Babylon too long in fact you know the exile in the exile is the most formative period really for the Hebrews uh, you know, and, and I think this could be a very formative period for us as as uh, as Anglican Christians uh, as we head full on at full speed into a cul-de-sac uh, and find out how ouch and horrible <laughs> that that is. Yeah, uh, I, I'm. I'm hope. I'm. I, I think I said to you earlier on. I'm not. Um, there's a difference between optimism and hopefulness. And I, I think we have to be, as Christians, hope-filled. I think that uh, one thing that uh, has struck me, uh, attending conferences like this and other events in, in recent years, actually, um, one thing that is striking to me is the number of highly intelligent, highly educated, very questioning young people there are who seem to be drawn at this moment to Christianity, be it Catholicism or Anglicanism. Yeah. 
And, and yeah. it, it, it is a thing, isn't it? Yeah. It is, there is something yeah. out there. Yeah, and they ain't going to take any part of my French bullshit from any vicar telling them some theological drivel. Because they can go online and they can, re you know, they can read Augustine. They can read Aquinas and find out that he's a real person. Uh, you know, that, that they can be, they come very informed uh, and they are prepping up. Uh, with, it's a sort of classical revival uh, that is um, quite extraordinary. Do you agree that it's a new, that it is a sort of new phenomenon happening? Does it seem, I, I yeah, think Yeah, I, I think it is actually, yeah. I, I think it's, uh, a friend and I said, you know, that, that we use the word small-o orthodoxy. In many ways, uh, perhaps a more accurate way to say is a sort of classical restoration of Anglicanism. Uh, and it's, it, it's got deep inquiry, deep roots. Um, it, it's intellectualized. Uh, it is both evangelical and Catholic, but it's more sacrament, increasingly more sacramental in its understanding, it is certainly uh, seeing groups looking afresh at the older liturgies and texts. Uh, uh, and, I, and I think that can but give us, give us hope, you know, that, that the seminaries are now getting people who are coming and saying, well, you know, uh, the articles don't say this, Reverend, you know, or, uh, well, I, I actually looked you know, I, I looked up Irenaeus online. It's not quite as you say it, is it? You know, that they're not going to take the kind of spoon feeding that so often is uh, the normal uh, way of doing things in much of education. Yeah. Well, Daniel French, I think, um, you know, on that note, which I think is a very hopeful note, the idea that there are uh, perhaps a, a new generation mm. of people um, seeking out the truths of, of the faith. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank, Thank you, you, you very much for Thank talking Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you. If you've enjoyed watching this interview, and I hope you have, and you'd like to see more of this kind of work, you might care to consider making a small donation. If you go to our website, newhumanum.org, and follow the links, you'll find a donation page. Anything you can give us would be gratefully received.